not strong enough. But we do need them. Because remember, we also don't want to make a fallacy. We don't want to make an error in logic by saying that this has to happen when someone could fight against it in another way. So what we use these, but you're right, it needs to be stronger. Why can't we, can't we substitute shoot for shall? We could, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. But it's, it's more or less the same meaning. But one second before we talk about that. General to specific, what is specific? The thesis statement. So this needs to be specific. This is too general. And if you look at the information, um, many people already have argued this. Mm -hmm. Many people all over the world have already argued this topic. Mm -hmm. How is this any different from what people have already said? Mm -hmm. So when you write an academic essay, one of the things you're wanting to think about is also how are you adding to the discussion yeah. about this topic? And so I agree with you that we need to be more specific. So, given an equal opportunity, what is this? Well, what does the opportunity mean? You know, what could we say instead of there? Equal is fine. Chant. Equal opportunity. Um, yeah, but an opportunity. I should have not circled this, but equal opportunity to serve. What does this mean? What precisely um, constitutes service? To join. To join the military. Okay, to join the military, but when in, in what position? Just in yeah, general? Yeah. Because what the problem is, is what we need to do is we need something more specific. Mm -hmm. So if we say an equal opportunity to serve, we need to then say service in terms of A, B, and C. And we need to give specific examples that then B1, body paragraph 1, remember our our normal like body paragraphs, this would be A, this would be B, this would be C, mm -hmm. and they would be supported in that way. Mm -hmm. But this right here, it's way too general because I can say anything <laughs> I want to with this. And the problem when we're not specific, when we're too broad, we don't make a good essay because we can, we're, um, I mean, unless you are writing 50 pages or more on this topic. It's too hard to really get to the point. Like, what is the specific argument that can be made in five paragraphs or in ten paragraphs, but no more? It's, this, is, this is too general to make an argument that's very specific for that. That um, word, number, <laughs> you know? Is, is this specific or not if I say nowadays when the white like man should be here? No? Can we substitute serve for um, join and contribute to the military? Equal opportunity to join and contribute to military service. Um, okay. Would that, that would be to join and contribute and contribute to the military service. Contribute. To military, or to military. Oh. Oh. service. That would be, um, but we would still need by A, B, and C. Yeah. Yeah, this would be closer. This is better. But um, we would still need to define what is A, what is B, what is C. For example, what might you, if this was your thesis statement, what might you put as A? By careful consideration of their capabilities. Um, okay, yeah, so women like men should be given an equal opportunity to join and contribute to the military service by considering um, their capabilities, natural capabilities. By consideration, uh, so it's not consideration, it's by placement according to natural ability. Yeah. What else? What could we do for the next body paragraph? 
we might also say something about what about placement in um, Okay, um, but that is, since we're talking about um, join and contribute, that's possible, but it would, it seems like that would be another, a, a different essay. Mm -hmm. Like, militaries in location. Like, military, the military, the U.S. military should um, alter its, um, should work to alter stereotypes of women in the armed forces by sh um, by having more discussion or more learning possibilities with cadets, future cadets, about gender equality by supporting women's rights if something happens. Um, like there's a lot of instances of rape. So if something like that occurs, that the woman's rights are supported. Mm -hmm. um, and so then you're still having X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Or I said A, B, C. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is everybody with me, ladies? Mm -hmm. Are you you're also with me? Okay. So I think that um, the idea is okay, but it's way too general. We want to remember in our academic essays, again, general, very specific. The other problem with this is what military? This, this, um, the author unfortunately tries to do too much with such a small essay. This needs to be either about the Ukrainian military, the US military, or any specific military, but by talking about militaries as a whole, it's too global, it's too general, it's too broad. That needs, that would be like a thesis, um, a research thesis for like a PhD dissertation <laughs> well, on like don't. military engagement. Well, we don't have any choice, <laughs> North Atlantic Tokenization. Um, but then it states specifically, like the North Atlantic Treaty Organization should monitor women's rights in the military by doing X, Y, Z. <laughs> okay, so just make sure that we, we, I guess the whole point is that we're specific and that we avoid phrases like, in my opinion. The other thing that I noticed in some of them, not all of them, is that we're, uh, some people are still using so as a transition. What did I tell you about using so as a transition? Why do we not use so as a transition statement? It's not appropriate for scientific papers. It's exactly. appropriate for English at all, but not appropriate for writing papers. That's right, because if you remember what so, I said, so. so is for, it's a transition statement for oral discourse, mm -hmm. not for written discourse. Yeah. So there's a, there's a difference. You hear me saying so all the time, but I'm talking to you all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I wrote a paper, the first thing I would do, is, well, I would never use so. But um, if I did, it would be on accident, and that would be my first pass to edit. That would be gone. <laughs> for colloquial language. Yeah, it's colloquial. That's right. Do you have to use does or would? Hmm? Uh, do you have to use does instead, for example? Does. 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 Yes. This. Instead of this. so? Mm -hmm. This. Does. No. Therefore. Yeah. Does. Therefore. Oh, yeah. does. Yes. Does. You could use thus. Yeah, they also said therefore. Mm -hmm. um, you can use something like meanwhile. Mm -hmm. um, no, not meanwhile. Meanwhile has a different meaning. But yeah, you could. There's. I think therefore would be the best. Uh, uh, one more question. Uh huh. Uh, what about the examples? They uh, they uh, said in the online course that we can use uh, examples from our own experience. Mm -hmm. uh, can we say that I? Uh, or experience something, or, or my son. <laughs> you know what? That's <laughs> a good question. In that case, you're still not allowed to use mm -hmm. I. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Um, you would say, instead, you would say, according to the author's experience. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. 
or you might say based on Da, 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 da. So, um, you, it's tricky, but you still can't use I, because you have to also distance yourself from the writing. Not only are you, um, hopefully, well, you're not, you're not addressing the reader mm -hmm. by saying we or are, but you're also not necessarily claiming the paper as a I or my. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Just an addition. Uh, to me, uh, whenever you deal with uh, scientific papers where the experimenting is involved, then you still have to specify the our lab or our group. That's different. Because it's yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. If we were writing a scientific paper where we did research for publication, um, you still might say, you could still use the authors. The, the authors, authors found, yeah, yeah. the authors found, you can still say that, or the group found, yeah. you, you don't, you actually still don't need to say our group or my or oh, blah, 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 yeah, um, you, you, there, there can be small, you can occasionally use that if you're, yeah, if you're discussing scientific research, like the outcome of an experiment. Or introduction. Yeah. Introduction. Mm. It's good for introduction. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I would still instead try to say the authors found as opposed to we found. Yeah. Um, but you're right. You can you can use it in a journal. However, in this this particular what we were doing, what our assignment, our academic writing was, was not allowing that because we were just reporting on research that we put together that we cobbled together about a topic based on news sources. But we, it's not our personal research that we're then reporting on. Absolutely. That's the difference, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions, comments, or concerns? No? Okay, um, all right, so let's, I guess, give the papers back. Okay, did you, can I keep this? Yeah. To give it back, you can, if you want to keep that, that's, Thank you. So how was the process for you? Did you learn anything? A lot? Good. Oh, stop. Um, what is this? Okay.
had several passages. Mm -hmm. And when I uploaded it, uh, they disappeared. Actually, I didn't, you know, pay attention to that. But when I looked at the comments of Alan, you know, the, the first thing they mentioned, you don't have paragraphs. <laughs> but I did. Oh, okay. So, the thing, uh, then I came to the conclusion that I had to, you know, explain the rules. Upload. Just to, to say that. Okay. Okay. Great. Um. to public speaking. So we have a repeat of writing, but we also have public speaking, um, which is a possibility. And this is the course intro video. Oh, I turned the sound off. Sorry about that. We're sure, here in the Department of Communication at the University of Washington. And I'm teaching an introduction to public speaking here on edX. And I've taught public speaking for over 17 years, coached for over 17 years at the college level. I've also already run a massive open online course for public speaking. Fantastic experience, and so I'm really excited to do it again here on edX. So at the broadest level, this course aims to help students design and deliver presentations that are concise, that are clear, and that are compelling. And each one of those terms maps onto a unit of the course. 
So to begin with, this is a class in both the design and the delivery of presentations. And that's because good speaking is more than simply good delivery. I mean, if, if it were just good delivery, a lot more people would be better at public speaking. But the fact of the matter is, if you are going to speak well, you need to understand how oral communication works. So we're going to start the course by thinking through some of the challenges and opportunities that pop up when a speaker stands up in front of an audience of listeners. So then once we've got that done, we'll move on to the first major unit, the first major assignment. And that aims at speaking concisely. So I have in mind here all those times when you have to speak at a moment's notice, at the drop of a hat. So we'll look at a number of speech skills and, and speech arrangement patterns and structures that can help you quickly organize your thoughts and articulate them well. So once we've got that taken care of, we'll move on to the second major unit of the course, which is speaking clearly. So here I'm thinking in terms of those, those times when you have to explain complex information or teach a new idea to an audience. So we'll think about, well, what does that take? in order to convey your message in a way that's easy for the audience to access. So unit one, unit two, we'll finish on this unit on speaking in a compelling fashion, speaking persuasively. So here we'll look at argument models and some ideas about vocabulary and performance and presentation so that you can craft presentations that invite agreement rather than disagreement. So that's kind of what the course is, those three major units, those key ideas. But that brings us to this question of, well, how does an online class in public speaking work? Those two terms do not normally exist in nature side by side. And the answer is, you determine your own level of involvement. So certainly there are lots of online videos and quizzes uh, that speak to some core concepts in public speaking. So people can watch those and get ideas about their speech in general and maybe a specific speech that they're working on for next week. Beyond that, we've got a number of discussion forums where we as a community can collaboratively analyze speeches to see what's working well or what's not working so well. Uh, and also there are lots of opportunities for participants to record their speeches, upload them to the course platform, and receive peer feedback. But you don't have to record a speech and post it either. I tried to craft this course uh, assuming multiple levels of engagement or different time commitments. I want that to be accessible because ultimately my goal is that regardless of your background, regardless of your level of involvement, at the end of this course you're able to get a set of speech skills that you can then use and adapt to a wide range of public speaking encounters. So I do hope you'll join us. Okay, so we will have a vote. <laughs> so I think I feel like um, I feel like this has been a, a good way for us to learn a lot of new information. So I'd like to continue using MOOCs. Um, and so what I'd like for us to look. Ooh, let's check the date before. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Great Christmas. <laughs> um, so what I'd like you to think about, and um, I will create a form on Google, and what I want you to think about is which one would you prefer? Would you like to continue with writing, or would you like to try public speaking? Mm -hmm. So if we do public speaking, we're going to do public speaking <laughs> in here. Um, and I think it would be a great opportunity for us. Um, I also think it would be very interesting from a teaching standpoint to see how public speaking is taught mm -hmm. in a US university mm -hmm. and what are some of like what are some of the resources they use what um, what are some of the new ways or old ways of teaching that they engage with because that can inform how you might also like what you like you can take what you like leave what you don't like how you might change your own teaching philosophy around public speaking so that will make a vote, either writing 2x, 2.2x, because we just did 2.1x. <laughs> so either writing 2.1x or public speaking x, okay? And um, I will create the form and we will vote um, before January 4th, mm -hmm. okay? And then please pay attention to... Um, Oh, for those of you receiving, we will send out an email. Mm -hmm. 
because I was going to say please pay attention to Facebook, but not everybody is on Facebook for the ETRC. So we will both inform you by Facebook on January 4th what, how many people voted and like what, what we're going to do. And um, we will also send out an email for those of you who are signed up for the newsletter so you have an idea of what will happen. And what I'll try to do is I'll also try to record other presentations on teaching methodology as well. So that it's not, I mean, I think this is very important, but I also understand that some of you have more desires for what you would like to learn about um, methodologically. So when the, with the form that I create, I'll also ask for more topics that you would like to have covered, okay, for next semester. All right? Everybody okay with that? Great. So um, in the last few minutes, yeah, I want to show you something. Yeah. back to the course itself. And, and how long is it? It's 10 weeks, so it's very long. very long. <laughs> and it's three to five hours a week. A week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, we could just do part of it. Mm -hmm. Like we don't, because as you can see, we can also simply audit the course, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we can, um, we, I can come up with a schedule where we're not doing every week for 10 weeks, because that's almost the entire semester. Mm -hmm. So we can come up with a schedule where we, we have other stuff going on mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. the, the, the writing course is five weeks only. Mm -hmm. okay. Five and then another five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so sure two parts. Mm -hmm. That's true. Is it going to go? No. Okay. So, um... This one, Oksana has already seen, but that's okay. <laughs> this is a very interesting video, and I think it gets at a lot of the heart of change that we see in education happening right now. Um, we will be, if you stay for the entire thing, you will be five minutes over 5.30, so I understand if you need to leave, but I think it's a really interesting video. We can stay a little bit after the video if you would like, maybe 10 extra minutes to talk about it um, and like what it means to us. If it plays. <laughs> Everything looks bigger than life when you're five. Okay. So everything was big, everything was strange, Sorry. and I remember Reloaded. feeling, I, I guess, a bit scared. Like, like many children. I reloaded it because you need to see this. So basically we've changed. Everything looks bigger than life when you're five. So everything was big, everything was strange, and I remember feeling, I, I guess, a bit scared. Like, like many children, I remember my school years fondly, but the bits I remember fondly aren't the bits I should have remembered. You know, I remember the, the play and the sport and the naughtiness and the playfulness and the, uh, the mischief. In fact, I remember the bits that were non standard it's incredibly privileged for me to have had education be such a, an important and, and uh, present part of my life. I remember being bored a lot. It didn't bring out the best in me, and uh, uh, you know I got through it anyhow. So it's you know it was I was not a great fit. Or the system was not a great fit for me. Uh, it's kind of crazy when you think about it that we take all these children and we force them to try to adapt to this really complex bureaucracy that's in the system. The system should adapt to them. The origins of traditional education lie inside the military to a large extent. They needed identical people, soldiers, administrators, and so on, so they produced the system. When the Industrial Revolution happened, they too wanted identical people in their assembly lines, even in their consumers. They wanted consumers to be identical so that everybody would buy the same things. So if you look at school that way, if you look at the fact that we process 20 or 30 kids at a time in a batch, just like in the factory, if you look at the fact that if you fail third grade, what do you do? We hold you back and we reprocess you. All matching the way the factory works. We built it on purpose. And it was really useful for its function. 
but we don't have a shortage of factory workers anymore. We're probably at the end of the death of education right now. I think the structures and the structures of school and learning from nine till three, uh, you know, working on your own, not working with others. Uh, I think that is that's, that's dead or dying. And I think learning is, uh, is just beginning. Well, I had ADD when I was growing up, and now it's like so many people do, and there's this feeling that there's something broken about the kid, because the kid doesn't conform to the system. So what we do is we medicate children to fit into the system, as opposed to saying, wait, the system is here for the kids. And there's lots of people who quite easily can sit still for eight hours, and take notes, and then two weeks later, say back what they wrote down. But there's also this huge population of extraordinarily talented, engaged people who can't learn that way. There's a very big difference between access to information and school. They used to be the same thing. Information is there online to anyone of the billion people who's got access to the internet. So what that means is if we give access to a four-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old, they will get the information if they want it. Knowing, knowing something, is probably an obsolete idea. You don't actually need to know anything. You can find out at the point when you need to know it. It's the teacher's job to point young minds towards the right kind of question. The teacher doesn't need to give any answers. His answers are everywhere. And we know now from years of measurements that learners who find the answers for themselves retain it better than if they're told the answer. Education has been very, very, very slow to look at data, to look at numbers, to look at analysis, what's actually happening. You know, we measure a test here, an exam there, but the detail of what's happening we don't really have. And that will be for sure the next important thing in our ability to analyze about health. Some of the people watching this will already be analyzing their health and their well-being in their sport. They'll be analyzing their learning too soon. Then we'll be really good to do. Newton is a data mining and an adaptive learning platform that allows anybody, anywhere, to upload content, it could be a, a publisher, an individual teacher, anything in between, and produce a course that will be uniquely personalized to each student based on what she knows, how she learns best. The textbook of the future is going to be delivered on connected devices. What that means is the incredible amount of data that students have always produced when they study are now capturable and usable. So Newton and any product built on Newton can figure out things like, you learn math best in the morning between 8.32 and 9.14 a.m. You learn science best from 40 minute bite sizes. At the 42 minute mark, your click rate always begins to decline. You should pull that from you then and move you to something else to keep you engaged. Um, that 35 minute burst to do with lunch every day, you're not retaining any of that. Just hang out with your friends and do that stuff in the afternoon instead when you learn better. Um, you learn this stuff best with short questions, this stuff best with complicated, difficult questions. We should return this type of material to you four days later for optimal attention. And here's exactly the things you're going to struggle with at your homework tonight, because you haven't learned some of the concepts that are embedded in that material. And we can go in real time, grab you the perfect little bit of content from last month or last year, and put that seamlessly in front of you so that you don't struggle. We can predict failure in advance and prevent it from happening. We're going to move from this kind of alienating and in some cases boring and in some cases frustrating model of everybody gets the exact same stuff. They're getting it at the exact same time, the exact same order, the exact same difficulty level. You know, for half the class it's too hard, for half the class it's, it's, it's too boring. It's going to get the most advanced kids, the most stimulating material, it's going, get, it's going to get them to unlock their potential in a way that they're not today. But for every kid, no matter how much you're struggling, 
you've got a path to success. It might take a little longer, but you will have a path to success no matter what. And also, the system gets smarter and smarter as, as more people use it. Strategies compete against each other to be, uh, to be replicated in the next generation. So the strategy that's most effective for you, once we find that, any kid who's like in the future will have that strategy teed up. It's a whole new thing. It's like, you know, when people, you know, when the automobile was invented, people didn't, weren't asking for the automobile, they were asking for faster horses. And people aren't really asking for, for a Newton because they don't really know what it is yet. But once they, once they see it and experience it, then, then they get it right away. You know, people um, say that education moves very slowly. Suddenly, you just need to be connected. That changes everything. It changes the basis on which you can make a contribution. You know, your, your brain can make a contribution at a distance. It's one thing to sit here in the media lab and, and talk about the future. Uh, I go very often into places which are about as different from media lab as it can get. And I think to myself, what, what does, what's the value of all my ideas over here? But there is one great hope. Wherever I go, the very first thing that I ask or I take out my phone and check for is do I have even that little bandwidth which will give me GPRS or something equivalent to that. And in the middle of jungles, I find that sometimes it says connected. And I know then that everything that I'm saying can go everywhere and work exactly the same way. It's a question of time. Connectivity is actually opening up the world. If you open up a village, for example, Bonsaso, and the students can actually now communicate with other students, say, in London, it means they start seeing the world in a different way. Educate a youth, and you educate a nation. Connect to Land is a partnership between Ericsson, together with our Institute, Columbia University, and the Millennium Promise. It's twofold. It provides scholarships to girls, and um, Connect to Land gives students computers and connectivity and shows them how to use it and how to get information. Education was limited to what the teacher could tell the students and the teacher was relying on that small textbook or those few books. So he was not getting that exposed. Now you are able to have access to a lot, a lot of information and the children start chatting and exchanging information and you know you can see there's much more things for them to talk about because they feel like they are more exposed and you know the children are more confident. They have the energy, they have quite a lifespan ahead of them and they are able to start thinking bigger. If you bring connectivity to them, they are actually able to do transactions and they can start small businesses which will uplift them. So I would say it is actually just opening up villages and the whole country and actually to say the whole continent. We are rolling it out in as many countries as possible in Africa and also in South America. It has potential to be upscaled to any country. The way we solve interesting problems is we fail and we fail and we fail and we fail until we succeed. And if you talk to people who have succeeded, what they almost all have in common is that they failed a hundred times before they succeeded. And that what separates them from people who aren't successful isn't that they succeeded, it's that they failed more than the other people did. I'm not sure it's okay for the schools to say, well, we have to optimize to process as many people as we can to match this testing regime. You can't imagine in a world where you sit down to do an exam and you ask yourself the question, I hope there are no surprises on the exam paper. And your teachers think, 
I hope I've prepared him for everything. How would that prepare you then to go out into a world that every day is going to surprise you? You know, it's full of the surprises of, of the economy, of society, of politics, of invention, of technology. Every day is a surprise. Learning prepares you to cope with the surprises. Education prepares you to cope with certainty. There is no certainty. The teacher stands between the child and the formal education trying to, to make the child face that system. And until that system breaks down or disappears, she has an incredibly difficult job of keeping the child's curiosity alive and at the same time saying, listen, by the time you're 16, you have to start memorizing certain things so that you can go and sit for that examination, clear it and, and get out of school properly. No one I know takes standardized tests for a living. So why are we using standardized tests to see if you're gonna be good when we don't have standardized tests after you take it? It's infected the entire marketing ecosystem of education because famous colleges are famous because they're picky about your SAT scores. Parents want their kids to go to a famous college. Parents push the school to create kids who will get into a famous college by doing well on the SAT all of which is corrupting the entire reason we have education in the first place. If we can get parents and teachers and kids and administrators to have this conversation, to just talk about it, then if at school board meetings or if at tenure reviews, the questions we are asking are not, how did your students do on the SAT? But instead we say, the SAT makes no sense, famous colleges are a scam, we need to create a different thing. And we can have this conversation, then change will start to happen. Coursera is a social entrepreneurship company that enables the best universities to take their best courses and put them out there so that everyone around the world with an internet connection can benefit from having access to a great education. As of today, which is the end of September, we have 1.5 million students from, I think, 196 countries. It's a little debatable how you count countries. We have uh, 195 courses from 33 universities. Our larger courses have an enrollment of 130,000. Our smaller courses have an enrollment of only about 10,000. Of course, it's still growing. Most of them haven't actually launched yet. Um, and a median class when it launches has about 50 to 60,000 students registered. Scale is interesting because it allows us to offer a high quality product at a very low marginal cost per student, which is what allows us to take people who really can't pay for an education and to provide them a free education, an education for free at the highest quality because the costs are so low per student. The student experience in Coursera is that the course starts on a given day and each week a student has access to numerous pieces. One piece is video lectures and it's interactive video so you don't sit there for an hour just watching video, you get to interact with the video. There is rigorous meaningful assessments of different kinds, not just multiple choice but real exercises with real depth. And there's a community of students that you get to interact with to ask questions and have those questions answered by your fellow students so that you get both a better learning experience via peer teaching as well as a social experience where you feel like there's a community of learners surrounding this intellectual activity. People often ask us whether universities are a thing of the past, whether universities are going to die out, and I definitely do not think so. Um, there is something tremendous about getting people together in a place where serendipitous interactions can happen, where you can have face-to-face -face mentoring between an instructor and students, where students can talk to each other and create together and learn to debate ideas. And so this on-campus physical experience at the moment has no virtual substitute that is equally effective. Our goal here, and I think one needs to be pragmatic about this, is not to equalize necessarily the opportunity um, of students 
who currently don't have any access and make it equal to what a fortunate Princeton student might have. Uh, because that might be a really worthy goal, but it's not something we necessarily can achieve in a short time frame. What we'd like to do is we'd like to bring both of these up to considerably better than where they are now, even if they don't end up being equal. If we've improved, improved a lot of both the on-campus students and the ones who currently don't have access, I think we've done an amazing thing. So let me explain how revolutions work. Revolutions destroy the perfect and then they enable the impossible. They never go from everything is good to everything is good. There's a lot of noise in the middle. If we look at the music business, first it destroyed the record label business, the internet. And only now is it enabling independent musicians to get heard. Education tends to move in stair step uh, functions in terms of change. So when it does change, it explosively changes. The move from you know, pre-printing press to post-printing press, that's a one-time transition in the history of, of the world in terms of education. Online education is going to be like that as well, and we want to make sure that as a species, the human species gets it right. One of the revolutions that we're going to see is where less and less of education is about conveyal of content, because that's going to be a commodity, and hopefully one that's available to everyone around the world. And a lot more of what we think of as education is going to go back to its original roots of teaching, where the instructor actually engages in a dialogue with the students and helps them um, develop thinking skills, problem-solving skills, passion for the discipline, the kinds of things that are much easier to do in a face-to-face -face setting and a lot harder to do in an online format, but for which really the college experience as we know it, that is the right place where you would like to put that kind of development of skills. Now what I want to see from school is get kids to want it. Create an environment where kids are restless until their need for information is satisfied. Teach kids to solve interesting problems. Not to memorize answers to problems we've already solved. Every time I get a question right, I get immediate engagement. I think the teacher has to step back and say, today's topic is this. But open your notebook and figure it out for yourself. What we need are teachers who will look people in the eye and believe in them and push them forward. And it's hard to do that on the internet. It really needs to be done in person. Schools decide to be better because they see children being better. And teachers, what does it say on the teacher's t-shirt? It says, we're in it for the outcome, not the income. You know, teachers are there because they can see the change in their children. If you add up every child in history, more children will leave school in the next 30 years than have ever left school in history. If I was going to make one change, I'd make their schooling just a little bit better. <laughs> and that will change history faster than anything else.
Um, but I find it very exciting. But you know, you don't have technology. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we admire your technology. Yeah, sure. It's all Google. It's all YouTube. But how do I? <laughs> you know, I try to be positive, but uh, huge influx of mediocrity we have to deal with. Mm. Yeah, maybe. I mean, there is there is that aspect or that element. But I think what maybe not may not be so clear about this particular video is that um, what they what they mean is um, I mean it won't be like the MOOC course. It will be like a, a course like us. And I would say, okay, our questions today are these. Find them. And then the students are engaged. And actually, the um, Sugata Mirta, the, the Indian guy, um, he has a brilliant TED Talk. Uh, we already put that away. But his TED Talk is, um, oh, I already deleted it. Ha ha, that's funny. OK, his TED Talk won the 2013, oh, it's frozen anyway. Um, he won the 2013 TED Talks competition for best TED Talk. And uh, he, I think, he lays out a very interesting um, argument. And there are arguments against his argument. But I would recommend watching his, uh, just if you Google TED Talks, top TED Talks, um, Soul, S. O L E. Um, this will help you to find him. Like if, if you just were to Google that. But basically, what he was saying is he found um, he would just place a computer in a village and then go away. And then the students were so interested in the information that they were finding that they were teaching themselves a lot of different things. And some of them even taught themselves. Um, really, really high-level courses. Like, there was a, a bunch of 12-year-olds who taught themselves about DNA replication in English. They, their first language was not English. It was an Indian language. And so the first thing they said to him was, you, you know, we had to learn English <laughs> in order for us to, to use this machine. What is What good is that? And then he was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> what did you learn? And they're like, nothing. And he's like, really? You learned nothing? And then one of the girls goes, well, aside from the fact that improper replication of DNA leads to genetic illnesses, <laughs> we learned nothing else. <laughs> but obviously they learned something. And they what they were learning is at the same level of courses that were taught in premier institutions. You know, but they le learn by themselves. So I think that you're, I, I think that there is a concern about mediocrity, but I think that there's also a possibility that many of the, uh, many of the students that we will work with in the future are really um, good at finding information, are really, and using that information to um, explore more topics and gain more knowledge in a way that um, is beneficial for all of us. I mean, I'm probably being a little too optimistic, but based on like the, the talks that I've seen from them and other talks that I've, I've watched regarding this topic, I, I, there are some cons, but I, I've seen a lot of very, very good things as well. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm a little nervous about it because I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what more am I gonna have to learn? <laughs> Sometimes I get tired. <laughs> something was mentioned about testing, yeah. and we're coming to the end of our semester. Uh, next week actually will be our uh, testing week, and I'm not sure what I'm checking. Mm -hmm. The capability to learn, or actually what, how they develop themselves, because it's very academical, you know. Yeah. It's just like score of 
your skills or actually what you've done. Exactly. Well, that, and that's one of the main arguments against testing in general. Like, what are we actually assessing? The tests that they mention, the SAT, that's the um, standard... Scholastic aptitude test. Yes, thank you. Scholastic aptitude test. It's um, taken in high school, and it, you are required to have good scores in order to get into university. And um, it's a meaningless test. I mean, it just really, it mostly tests your ability to take the test. So what are you testing? So I think that that's something that we have been struggling with for a long time. Even Piaget, who wrote one of the first standardized tests for the French, he was like, well, why would we do that? <laughs> when they asked him to do it, he's like, no, that's completely against educational <laughs> principles. Why would we do this? Like, not everybody is the same. You can't monitor and measure in that way. And they said, we'll do it anyway. And he went, okay. <laughs> and so now we have all these, like, standardized exams. And they don't always test what they should be testing. And they don't test the breadth of knowledge. So you have students who are extremely smart, but who don't do well with the test. And so their scores aren't as high as maybe someone who's very good at the test, but has no critical thinking. Is that common in the United States of America or just here in Um, I think I, I I would say it's probably it's probably a, it's probably the same. Yeah. I would I would imagine. Well, I there mean, are, there are two sorts of people. First, like you could be the legal students mm -hmm. who do the, who do well legally on a legal basis, and there are well people who do some kind of well obtain some kind of hidden education been tested wrong. And this is what I remember about myself. I normally had uh, bad grades when I went to university. Even though I'm doing okay, and I was doing okay that time. But in case if I was ever tested, then you know, my grades wouldn't be high enough. And well then, as a result of that, I obtained much more extensive knowledge from the subject than others. Mm -hmm. Just due to, well, double effort mm -hmm. I had to. Do compared to others. And there were some other people like myself who obtained that type of hidden education you were talking mm -hmm. about. And to me, it makes perfect sense. It's if your country wants you to achieve more than others. That we won't what? I missed the last Because your part. country wants you to achieve more than others. Oh. It occurred to me, and I went to be in Australia, and United States of America, and I did okay there. They even considered me a horse deal. Well, mm -hmm. it's, it's just not an exceptional. Capabilities. I suggest I'm not the only one. There are cones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, of US course. Yeah. So. Well, I, I struggled a lot. I, and I think this is why I have a different opinion towards education as well. When I was young, I did not want to learn to read. I was not having any of it. <laughs> and I really struggled with reading. And it wasn't until...